Hello adventurers, welcome back to the Red Quills where we go through all of the tips and tricks that you can add to your fantasy world to make it as lush and vibrant as our own. Now today we're discussing culture in your fantasy maps and worlds, something that we've written about in our blog posts and talked about a little bit in some of our videos in the past, but we're going to go more into depth on it today. We're going to start off by giving you this overview of the Rostovani peoples. This is the map that we're going to be using. I'll be drawing it during this video, showing you the steps that I take, the tools that I use, and the insights that I will give you so that you can elevate your world building experience. Now this video goes with the short series that releasing this week on culture and fantasy worlds. Check that out if you want more information or help. And as always, if you do like this video, leave a comment below or share it with your friends. Now this map contains several differences from the standard maps that I generally use. Uh, one of the most obvious is of course the little illustrations that I've got on here, but there's really four different levels of cultural world building you can put into your maps. I'll go through each of them here and the different techniques that I've used to sh showcase the culture of this world. Now with every single map I do, I always start the same way. I'm gonna sketch out the consonants first, the continental shapes. I'm gonna use this uh, 0.7 millimeter black fine liner pen. All the tools are in the description, by the way, if you wanna use the same ones that I do. And I'm gonna create a centralized big continent in the middle and a few offshoot islands uh, around the outside. A bit of a peninsula uh, with a small island on the right hand side there. Now it's important to note as I'm doing this that when you're creating a fantasy world, the culture of that world is the foundation upon which you build the themes that your characters, that your readers, that your players will be exploring. And they're, they're themes like heroism and villainy, religion and magic, or the struggle between the known and the unknown. Your world will have to have these concepts built into its very fabric. So it's important to spend some time early on at this stage, the map drawing stage, to work out the kinks and create something three-dimensional to explore. As with all of my maps, I recommend the same order of drawing them every single time. You want to start with the coastlines and the mountains, then you want to go through and do the labeling and the iconography, and then you want to go through the terrain and any illustrations last. Illustrations before terrain, generally speaking. And the reason for that is that it will stop your map from feeling cluttered. If you want more information on that, you can check out uh, the other video at the start of this series, which is how to draw a better map, which goes into this step-by-step -step process. Now that I've done the outlines and the continents, I'm going to take this opportunity to start talking about history because what I'm going to add on the top of the map is the shape of what could be an ancient primordial being, its body long since decayed. So I'm going to add some lakes where its torso and its pelvis should be. I'm going to add some mountains where the hands are and a, an ambiguously shaped mountain range for the skull. Now we've discussed history before on this channel uh, in, in your world building and in your maps. We're going to apply it specifically to the map making in your world today. Now the history of your world is of course critical to building the feeling of, of living inside it. It provides the precedent for events and activities and contexts for your heroes. In previous maps we've explored it by adding timelines in the borders for instance. But in this particular video we're only going to go into what the map itself actually contains. So there are four different areas that you can use to illustrate your history. And we're going to talk about the creation first, the very beginning of your world, because I've just made this very large body decaying. Because uh, creation myths are the foundation of any mythology. Uh, they keep the kids in line at night, they provide a structure for the perspective of the world and its activities, and they provide perspective for you, for the world builder. They can also give a lot of context for any ultimate villains of your world. It's <laughs> If you're playing a role-playing game or if you're writing a novel, then the ultimate big bad is on the same level as, or is the same creature as the thing that created the world. I mean, not for nothing is it said, I brought you into this world and I can take you out of it. But in terms of your maps, they're influenced by creation on the biggest scales, continental shapes, global patterns, reflections, mountain ranges and oceans in the shape of titanic primordial beings, in this case, it's lakes and mountains on a massive, massive scale here. Remember that these shapes don't need to be precise or accurate. They don't even need to be 
real. In this case, in this map, that's just ambiguous enough that you could look at it and say, okay, that is the decaying body of a, an elder giant. Or you could look at it and say, that's nah, just coincidence. There are dozens, hundreds of mountains around the world where people look at it and say, that looks like a person lying down. Make it just ambiguous enough that there is room for doubt. Because over time, if it is really the body of an ancient primordial being, it will decay. You know, time will wear down at its surface so that they only vaguely look like the original shapes. Now I'm going to go into the next part of your history, which is uh, old magics. Now this is really for high fantasy settings, but uh, you can definitely add them into your world. I'm going to use the illustrations to highlight them a bit more, and I'm going to add in a couple of other details. So for worlds with any magic at all, the common theme of that is the old masters, which is, is a term that we use for the arts in our world. They brought the powers of magic to bear. They understand the secrets of the universe. They had powers that we can only dream of now. And in your world, these could express themselves in things like floating cities, you know, wondrous towers or statues, natural magics like ley lines. They can influence pilgrimages to aspiring mages. They can uh, grow cultures around the monuments of their power. The decay of time is a strong theme when you're talking about old magics. And you can put these on your maps in a variety of different ways. Later on, in my illustrations, I'll show a few of the ancient magical sites, and I'm gonna add some ley lines in later on. I'll talk about those in a bit though. Next, we'll get onto the archaic part of your history, which is where your civilization begins. It's not necessarily a magical history, but unless the cities and monuments were gifted to them by the gods or by their creators, which is a fun idea, then there was a time when the people of your world huddled in huts or caves in the night. Once they were fearful of the shadows, they worshipped the fire. And on the page, that archaic history shows itself in sites of ancient worship or, or an unknown function. Stonehenges, ancient barrows, gateways of dark stone. Their meanings are lost to time, their carvings are worn away by the wind and the water. They imply emotions strong enough to inspire such labors to build, and they add a mystery to your world as well as a history. Which brings us, of course, to the last part of your history, which is the easiest of all, it's the divergences. So, why are there different kingdoms, empires? Why are there different peoples? Where do the different languages come from? On a map, different peoples and their leaders imply a history of sundered populations of war and separation. People multiply and move apart over time. What was the cause? Your map can show quite a large part of this context simply by being on the page itself. Different cities sharing the same name, different areas under the same rule, completely different kingdoms right next to each other. All of these have an implication, have a subtext that you can use to give your world some culture. Now, as I'm going through here, you can see that I've started doing the drawing and I wanted to take some time to talk about the illustrations that you can add to your map because there are quite a few, you know, really nice social media or, you know, YouTube tutorials about map making and they do illustrations like this. I wanted to talk to you about it as someone who's not necessarily super good at it themselves, but uh, I did it on this map because it does give a certain feel to your map and it's not as difficult as you might think. You don't need to be a super talented artist in order to get that skill in map making. So I'm going to take you through how I do it. And it's it's really, really simple. All you need are three different pens and a pencil, because the first thing you got to do is you've got to find a small geometric shape, like a coin, a button, anything, you know, about a couple of centimeters across, less than an inch. You're going to use that to give yourself the shape of the sketch and then you're going to make a very small sketch of what you want inside it. So in this case, it could be floating cities, it could be you know, ancient henges, it could be stone towers, whatever. Do the sketch. Use a thicker pen on the outside of the sketch. In this case, it's a 0.4 millimeter black fine line. Use that to give the outside of the shape and the really big kind of divisional parts of the, the, the drawing. So the shape of towers, individual you know hinges that kind of thing then you come in with a smaller pen in this case the 0.1 millimeter fine line and you use that to give definition to the inside of shapes so cracks in towers doorways in buildings 
you know, smaller and smaller details. And then you come in with the last pen, in this case it's a 0 0.05 millimeter black fine liner pen, and you use that to do shading. Now I use stippling on these because stippling gives the impression on a very small scale like this of details that the eye can't quite pick up. And that's all you need to do. It's as simple as that. If you can draw even a remotely straight line, if you can do a fairly good sketch, then you've got a nice little illustration. And because it's so small, you don't need to be fantastic at it. That's all you really need. So as we go through this, I'm gonna just keep showing you how I made these illustrations. And I'm gonna talk about uh, the societies in your map because you know our world is complicated enough on this topic, despite all of us being the same species, we can't seem to agree on very much at all. But the conflict between societies is a driving factor in any world, including your own. But the nature of the conflict and the focus of their differences is up to the theme of your world. And it can be difficult to determine what the differences between societies are without dipping into what feels like an inherent racism. So here's a few tips to help you flesh out your fantasy people without falling back on problematic thinking. So the first question to ask yourself is what are the universal assumptions? All people, all living things share some uniting traits, the, the, the drive to eat, the urge to find shells, the longing for companionships, these are all traits that are shared by every single creature. Any species which wishes to survive and wants to propagate itself breathes these traits into its members. Those that don't adhere are the outliers. And any society, any gathering of individuals also shares some tra traits. They also have to have a division of labor. They also have to have a set of governing rules and principles. They apply the same needs to the group as they do to the individual. A city needs food. It must remain safe. It must trade. And those that don't quickly decay and deteriorate. And the benefit of determining what those universal assumptions are is that you can use those to find out who are the truly frightening, who are the truly alien. If these traits are universal, then those that don't adhere to them are dangerous. But remember, all societies must attempt to survive. Utter chaos is unsustainable. So the second question is, what is society's most pressing problem? Any given specific society, that is. Once you've determined what reunites everyone, you need to find their points of differences. So they won't be character traits. Saying that a whole people are greedy or an entire town is kind is a vast oversimplification. It causes a lot of problems. So instead, you've got to find what a culture is focused on and go from there. All societies want to survive, so their focus will be on their most pressing problem. In areas of desolation or waste, pure survival is their creed. Their societies will have customs, and laws, and traditions to help them live in harsh conditions and ensure that they can continue to do so. But in more lush, inviting areas, their most pressing problems will be the problems of attack or invasion because others will want to live there too and remove any existing inhabitants. So the third question is, how does that problem and that adaptation to the problem express itself? So now you can begin to create what people look like. Their reaction to their problem, according to their uniting tra traits, will change the way that an individual acts. So, you know, perhaps the people living in a desert are calm and collected, they're quiet and reserved because the desert air dries out the mouth and drains water. So the inhabitants try to lower their energy. What began as a simple individual reaction becomes a social custom. It means that in areas in which water and shade are abundant or at night, they will express themselves more exuberantly. And there are all sorts of ways that this can go. People living in the ice may appear to be kindly and welcoming to outsiders, often embracing or sharing space with visitors because they share heat. And on a wider scale, a people can be affected by themselves. Survival on the individual scale over time affects the expression of culture on a wider scale. All right, so we're beginning to move through the illustrations and we're gonna to get to icons. And as we go through the icons, I'll talk about the different landmarks and sites that you can add to your maps to really elevate the kind of culture that you're showing. Because there are the standard icons, of course, there's, uh, you know, there's roads, there's towns, there's castles, there's borders, you know, rivers and trees and whatnot. But if you want to explore the culture, you can add a few different things in to elevate the understanding of the person reading the map of what it's like for people on the ground. So it's a very easy way to add some history, add some culture. It also gives you a destination. 
if you are working on giving protagonists movement within the world and they inform the reader of previous events, local superstitions, religions, magic, things like that. So I recently did a short on uh, YouTube and my social media on drawing the different sites and icons on your map and adding new concepts in to flesh out some history. If you want some specific icons that aren't in this video, I suggest you go and check that out. I'll put the link in the description below. But here's a list of six different icons that you can kind of put in. As I go through, we'll show a few of them, but not all of them uh, in this video. So the first one is battlefields. I put them in, uh, for instance, in my last map. You can add them in quite easily. They're generally close to something of a tactical advantage or a city or a natural resource. They can be very unassuming landmarks, you know, from the ground, but battlefields massively impact on local traditions and societies. They imply war and death and their remembrance implies repentance or sorrow. Uh, you can add in circles or hinges. I did an illustration of one before. Stone circles and ancient hinges are mysterious monuments to astronomical phenomena. They're also a known anchor for the Fae if you're a fan of the mythology of the British Isles. They can act as doorways or they can act as clues to ancient secrets. It's up to you, but uh, they're a good one to add it if you have a lot of that archaic history. If you've got more of that mystical history, you can add in uh, echoes, which are places where you've got ancient emotion or events that have scarred the face of the world. The ghosts and spirits are the memories of individuals. Echoes are rifts caused by untold calamities, you know, natural disasters like floods or hurricanes or earthquakes, or something more man-made like a massive battle or a biological warfare. Fortresses are a staple all the time, but it's it's important to remember that they have a cultural impact as well as a military one. People living around a fortress will pay attention to it as a mark of power. Uh, they'll feel protected by it, but they'll also feel um, overshadowed by it. I'm also going to talk about gateways here as well. We did talk about circles and hinges. Gateways are, are not circles of them, they're just, just gates standing in the middle of nowhere. I've got a gate on this map. It uh, it's, leads to another side of the world, it's connected to a ley line. So you can use things like gates to, to add hints about ancient empires, connections of natural magic, things like that. The last kind of icon you could add is a, is a monument, which are obviously man-made. They can be for battles, they can be for heroes, they can be for moments of great importance. They could also be used as a vanity project for the rich and powerful. Either way, if they're important enough to be marked on a map, they'll have some cultural significance to the locals. All right, we've gone through, we've got the basic shape of the societies on this peninsula, uh, the Rostovani people. So we've got the mountain ranges, we've got the continents, uh, we've got some cities, and we've got the icons for the various significant sites or important locations. So in this case, I've got a couple of uh, significant cities there, generally the capital cities of the various kingdoms or empires are on there. But I've also got some inexplicable magical places. So I've got the floating city of Injury there, I've got a court of sorcerers, I've got the Tower of Dawn, and then to the north, around that area, which I said earlier was going to be the, the forming body of a titan, I've got more magical, inexplicable, like the stone tree, the first city, the crown of the world, the cradle, the watcher, things that imply an older history, which is always a very big favorite for the fantasy genre. And you can use ideas like that in your own world. So I'm going to take this time to actually add in another kind of magical phenomenon in the form of ley lines. Uh, so for those who aren't familiar with the concept of ley lines, the idea is that they are these vast interconnected lines of power that stretch across the face of the world. So they tend to run independently or parallel to one another and on their convergences where they intersect you'll have places of incredible power so in this case i'm going to have a couple of my ley lines intersect on the place where the floating city of injury is so from the illustration you can see that that is a it's a city on three floating islands and i'm also going to while i'm there i'm gonna just sketch a little orbit little path for the floating city so it continually moves around the same circle over and over and over again which is which is focused on those converging ley lines 
So these are just a couple of ideas that you can use. Um, I have chosen points of significant magical power to be the deciding factor as to where the ley lines run. Uh, I think it adds a very interesting new level of magic to my fantasy maps. You may end up using it, you may not end up using it, but I would recommend just just chucking it in there. Chucking it in there. If you're writing a novel, if you're if you're playing a, a role-playing game, if you want a Deus Ex Machina later on, just chuck it in there. See how you go. I'm also going to label them different names because I'm a bit like that. I'm gonna name them the spring and summer and autumn lines. What that means, I don't know at this point. It might mean something, it might mean nothing. Who can say? And of course now comes the favorite part of anyone making a fantasy map, which is that you have to go through and you have to label everything. Uh, I know that people can find this frustrating. If you're watching this video, if you find yourself unable to come up with names for fantasy places, rest assured it's fun for no one who has to do this several times a week. Even if you get more experienced, coming up with names is something that I personally really struggle with. So quite a few of the places on this particular map have been recycled from previous maps that I've done. But generally what I tend to do, uh, just for a hot tip, is I tend to uh, find online lists of baby names, and then I'll just mix and match the syllables. Uh, I also use poetry to determine cadence for various names. So generally speaking, uh, what I'll do is for particularly tradition-based systems, I'll have all of their cities, all of their major capitals, all of their forts follow the same kind of, of rhythm. They'll go da-dum-da-dum, or you know, da-da-da. Or they'll all share a same syllable, the same syllable. So for instance, in another one of my maps, all of the dwarven cities are called Heim something. And the suffix of that Heim, Heim ild, Heim is, uh, the various elements. So it can be really, really simple. You don't need to overthink it. Uh, I personally wouldn't rely on name generators on the internet because coming up with them for yourself gives you more opportunity to think about the world. It might be a little bit extra effort early on, but it'll pay off when you're getting into the exploration of it. Now I'm going to go through and I'm going to do all the terrain which is one of the most time-consuming parts of, of any map. You don't really need to do this. It's not relevant for a, a cultural map, really. I add it in because it looks nice. I find it quite satisfying to look at, and it does take me a solid couple of hours on a map like this. So I have to go through and I have to draw all the trees, do all the farmlands. If you've got one map that you're gonna be using, I would recommend doing it, honestly. It's a great detail makes it look nice, you can put it on your wall, and you'll have something that you're proud of at the end of the day. And that's the important part here. I've also gone through and added in to this map specifically, on top of the illustrations which highlight the iconic locations or specific magical sites, I've just put in some purple icons for centers of learning. And you can find the icon amongst the list on my other shorts feed, but it's just a really simple way of differentiating not just where the learned people are in any given world, but also there's a little bit of socioeconomic disparity wherever there is a university. Um, in any world pre the modern era, being well educated was always a mark of being fairly wealthy. And you can use that to your advantage. You won't find a university catering to the poor, generally speaking. So those universities, I've also got some moots. So moots, M-O-O-T, is just an ancient sort of gathering. Um, it's Germanic in origin, I believe. I've got a few of them, and where I've put them on the map corresponds to the ancient borders of kingdoms. So not the current borders of kingdoms, ancient borders of kingdoms. So again, that's another level of history that we've added on here. That's my reference to the divergences that I mentioned before, because as I said, there's four different kinds of history you can put on your map. I've put in the giant in the north, which is my nod to the, uh, the creation. I've put in the floating cities and the massive monuments like the White Tower or the Tower in White, and they're my nod to the old magics. I've got ancient henges 
and gateways like the Satmala on the Court of Sorcerers and the Tower of Dawn, which are a reference to the Archaic Ages. And I've got these moods as references to the divergences in cultures. There were older kingdoms here, and now they're gone. And you can tell that from the map because of all these details that you've added in. So now that it's really coming together, you can see that the final product shows layers upon layers of culture and history and society. I also want to make note of something that I didn't end up managing to put in this map. Uh, just for everyone's reference, this took me about seven hours to do, not including breaks that I took. Uh, so start to finish, it was about seven hours to do this map and I'm still not finished. Uh, between us, I actually made a bit of a mess and I went to do the compass of this map because my hands were shaking and I probably should have put it down about 15 to 20 minutes earlier. But I will fix that, as they say, in post. But that being said, I didn't get the opportunity to put in a couple of details that I would have liked to, one of which is the languages. Uh, I personally find languages really, really interesting. I think that they are the basis for a lot of cultures and they can tell you a lot about what a culture values and how it interacts with itself. Uh, and I didn't get to put it in here, but generally speaking, what I would have done is I would have made uh, another color and I would have noted under the different kingdoms or empires, so under their little red labels, just in a small, say, gray pen, you know, they speak, for instance, in the empire of Kolodar, they speak Kolidi or Kolodarin, you know, just in a little fine gray pen there. And then when you put the little areas, the different, um, you know, regions like the borderlands or Bingavani, just under those, you can say, you know, collar down Bingavani dialect. It's again, you don't really need to go that far for every map, but I think it really adds just a level. And you can remind yourself of things like that by looking at the map. You can express it, you know, through accents. You know, each of these different areas will have different accents in the same languages. You know, different kingdoms would definitely have different languages. You know, those on the, the western side of the mountains, you know, the, the, the majocracy and the theocracy, they would speak different languages to the empire of Kothadar on the eastern side. And then they would speak another language from the war holds of the Antimath to the north. So it's things like that that are important to remember. So I'm finishing up now. I'm going to go over the dot points of what we did to achieve this map of culture and what you could add to your own map to really elevate the world building. So the first thing I did of course is uh, sketch the continents and when you do so think about the creation of your world you can add in references to any creation myths, any mountain ranges that look like people sleeping etc etc. Then you go in and you want to do the labeling and at this point you're making references to a couple of things. The first of course is the different societies, that's the most obvious, but you want to think about the divergences in those societies. Who's related to who, how have they split up in the past, how have they unified in the past, all of those will be shown by your labeling. Then you want to go and you want to start doing your icons and in this case the illustrations. I did the illustrations before the icons because they take up a bit more room. You don't want to be crowded and the illustrations of the icons will show you more about the old magics, the archaic parts of your history, the significant sites that still affect the people living in the lands around them. After we did the icons, which referenced a lot of the different histories and the cultures, we went through and we added in a few different details. I added in the ley lines, which were also a reference to natural magic and connected several of the important sites around the map. And then we went through, we labeled the different areas, um, making specific references to the kingdoms and their borders and who is neighboring who. Then we went through and added in a few other details, added in some universities, some moots, some border points, uh, the orbit of the floating cities, and then the terrain. The terrain, of course, uh, adds the important understanding of, of who lives where, what struggles they have to go through, whether they have easy lives or difficult lives, things like that. And now we're just finishing off with the shading. I'm just looking at the mountain ranges now. Generally speaking, I would show you doing the compass and the legend, but in this case I made a bit of a mess of it, so you will have to see that on several of my other videos. I will be posting the map on my website if you want to go and download the A2 copy if you want to use it for your own world. Be very welcome to do so. I've also got a YouTube short series coming out on this topic on my YouTube channel, so follow, subscribe if you want that detail. 
As always, thank you so much to my supporters. I'm happy to keep making these. If you've got specific questions, I've tried to cover a lot of different topics in this video. If you want anything more specific, comment it below. I'll add it to one of my future videos. Take it easy and good luck on those adventures.